Well, good morning and welcome to Belong Church, and we're so happy that you're along with us on this Valentine's Day. So before we say anything else, let me say happy Valentine's Day to everyone, whether you're having been married for 27 years like Lenore and I, or many more like my parents, or you fill in the blank, or maybe you're just with your significant other, or maybe you're like some other people I know who are looking for your significant other, happy Valentine's Day no matter where it finds you. That just cracks me up quite a bit. Lenore and Michael and I have been um, the last couple of days in Georgia helping some pastor friends of ours with a marriage conference. And so we're just in in the winding down of all of that stuff. But we're so happy to be here with you today. We're going to look at the love chapter. And that might be predictable if you've ever been to church and, and been there on a Valentine's Day. And this is when we typically will have marriage conferences and like we just went through. And this is when you turn your attention to marriages and love and relationships and those kinds of things. But as I typically say, and Michael usually calls me out on it, this probably isn't going to be your typical message that you're going to have heard on the love chapter. It's probably not going to be the take that you've always heard on it. And I always am challenged to try and bring it in such a way that it will always encourage you and go, huh, I never thought of it like that. And that is certainly what happened to me as I read this and as I prepared this. So let's just jump and dive right in. So if you're following along with me in your Bible, we're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we're going to read a lot of the first part of that. Now the Apostle Paul is teaching the Corinthians. This is a letter that was written to the church in Corinth. There's two different letters, the first one and the second one is 1 Corinthians, and the next one is 2 Corinthians. And of course, the translators divided it all up into chapters and into verses, so it's easier for us to follow. But here we see just one of the most amazing thoughts when it comes to being a Christian, when it comes to being someone who is a Christ follower, if I can say it like that. He talks about these superlative, these way out there, like pushing it to the furthest extreme. And then he lays it out. In verse 1, he says this. Suppose I speak in the languages of human beings or of angels. In other words, I can talk to every language on the earth, and I have a heavenly language. Okay, so I can only speak one language, barely that one, okay, English. And then there's other ones. I used to be able to do sign language just a little bit, and I wasn't that good at it. I made people laugh and be confused most of the time when I tried to use sign language. God help you if I'm interpreting for anything. But there are people who know six and seven and eight languages, but that's still just a drop of the bucket. So let's put it to the the ultimate. I could speak every language there is in the entire universe. And I can even speak in a heavenly language. He continues, if I don't have love, all of that that may seem impressive to everybody else is only a loud gong or a noisy cymbal. And I don't know about you. I don't know if you've ever been around a band or in a practice thing or something, but I've grown up in in music kind of things and leading bands and directing the bands. And I have a new drummer that would get in there, and I'm thinking of a couple, in fact, right now. And one of them would play the ride so hard, like his nervous energy, that's what he would play so hard that I literally went over and took it off and said, okay, you don't have this symbol anymore because you're driving me crazy. Because it was over the top, it was too much. Because if you've ever been in that situation, as beautiful as the symbol can be, and even the, 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 cha- the, the, the loudness of a gong can be just, it's meant to be in small doses. It's most, but if you just like go off on it all the time, it's just like, ah, I just can't take it. He's like, hey, you could do all of these wonderful things, be the most extreme of having all these languages even a heavenly language. But if you don't have love, it's just arrogance. Wow. Continuing. Verse 2. Suppose I have the gift of prophecy. Suppose I can understand all the secret things of God and know everything about him. Again, he's throwing it out to the furthest extreme. I mean, everybody would love to have the gift of prophecy. 
I personally don't think I would. Um, In fact, that's one of the things that someone's prophesied that over me, that you're going to have a tinge of the prophetic. I'm like, oh, God, please, no, I don't really don't want that. But everybody likes to be around someone who's prophetic to be able to say, okay, tell me what's going to happen. Okay, so I could have that big gift that no matter what anybody came up to, it was almost like a fortune teller that I can tell you everything's going to happen. That would be such a covetous thing that people would want because it would make you popular with people. And then suppose I could understand every secret thing of God so that every mystery that someone's like, hey, um, I don't really understand this about God. Can you explain this? And I open up and I can tell you all the mysteries and all the secrets of God. And I know everything about him. Again, those are superlative, way out here extremes. It's impossible, okay? But he's saying, let's say I could attain to that. And suppose I have enough faith to move a mountain. If I don't have love, I am nothing at all. Verse 3, suppose I give everything I have to the poor, See, he's going through all of these things that we would identify in church as being good, as being the best, all of these churchy kinds of things. And suppose I give myself over to a difficult life so I can brag to say, oh, look at what I've given up. Oh, look at me. I did all of this for God. He said, you did all of that, but if you don't have love, you got nothing. Then he goes with verse 4, which is where we're going. Let me tell you what love is, he says. Love is patient. Love is kind. Now, if you've ever been to a wedding, you've most likely heard this part of Scripture quoted because it's in almost every wedding ceremony. In fact, I've done many, and I did one a week ago. And I quoted this this exact same Scripture. So this isn't new information. This isn't like, I've never heard that love is patient. I've never heard that love is kind. No, in fact, it might be the opposite. We've heard it so much that we just go, maybe you can even fill in the next one for me. But I want us to look at what this really means. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not want what belongs to others. It does not brag and it is not proud. It does not dishonor dishonor other people. It does not look out for its own interest. It does not easily become angry. It does not keep track of other people's wrongs. Wow, that's a mouthful right there. Love is not happy with evil, but it is full of joy when the truth is spoken. Verse 7, it always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it never gives up. Love never fails, but prophecy will pass away. Speaking in languages that have not been known before will end, and knowledge will pass away. Now, while this is one of the most common verses it's used in marriage ceremonies, it's often preached, particularly around this time of the year, I think that we kind of skip over all of those things. But I want you to see a different perspective. See, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, he says, so we know that God loves us, right? We know that. If you don't know that, let me be the first one to tell you, God loves you. In fact, John 3, 16, not to be conf- confused with 1 John 4, 16, but John 3, 16, a different book earlier in the Bible, says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave Jesus so that you could come to know him. He loves you so much. So John, in 1 John 4, 16 here, is setting the precedence. So we know that God loves us. I like what the the next part of it says in the NIRV. We depend on it. I don't know about you, but I need God's love. I need God's love in my life to help me make it through today and through tomorrow. But he looked at this. He says, God is love. Let me start over. So we know that God loves us and we depend on it, but God is love. And anyone who leads a life of love is joined with God and God is joined with them. 
So I want to go through 1 Corinthians again with this different perspective that he's not describing what you should be attaining to, that love is patient, that's the way you should be. Love is kind, that's the way you should be. These aren't a checklist for us to say, hey, this is what I'm trying to attain to. But can I tell you, it's describing who God is. Take what I'm supposed to attain to off the table for just a moment. Obviously, I'm supposed to attain to be like God. He created us in his image to be like him. I'm going to chase a bunny path for just a second. The enemy came with a lie to Eve and said, if you do this thing, God knows you will be like him. You are already like him. She was already like him. Adam was already like him because they were created in God's image. The lie from the enemy came trying to get you to have what you already had. You see? We see in 1 Corinthians 13 a description of who God is. But I want you not to look at it from how I need to be like God, but I want you to receive it as how he is towards you, how he is towards me. This will change your life. Look at it. Love is patient. God's love who God is, God is love, is patient. If you don't understand, Pastor Kevin, I, I really want to follow God, but I just keep making the same mistakes. Surely God is annoyed with me by now. No. See, love is patient. God is patient. Love is kind. God is kind. What does kindness mean? It means that when I don't deserve it, I still get the kindness. It doesn't want what belongs to others. God isn't trying to take anything from you. In fact, when those situations happen, when there are deaths that we can't understand, and people say, well, God needed that, that baby or that child up in heaven. No, he didn't. See, it says right here, God, he doesn't want what belongs to others. He doesn't want your child brought up there. There are accidents. There's things that we don't understand. There's things that we don't understand. We'll never know. And we'll see one day and go, okay, I, I can have a better understanding. We don't have that now. But can I tell you, he doesn't want his, what is here. He doesn't want his, what is from you, from you. He's not there to steal from you and leave you wanting just so he can have another person in heaven. Okay, so let me just, I, I hope, I'm just glossing over that, but receive that if that's for you. Does not brag. You don't see God bragging, saying, hey, I can do all these things, and who are you? No, he's not proud. He's not puffed up. He's the creator of the universe. He can do anything he wants to. And one of the most amazing things to me is he's not into these outward expressions of just showing off. I say it many times that if he was into sensationalism, when Jesus was on the, on the cross, he could have just been up there and go, Pew! and shoot, start shooting the nails out and just levitate off the cross and start like hovering over everybody and everybody like, oh my gosh, I believe, I believe, I believe. See, he's not that kind of a guy. He's not that kind of a God. And yet I think most of us would, <laughs> in all honesty, if we were God. He's not proud in boasting of who he is. He'll sit in the back of the room and wait for you. Again, patiently and showing you kindness. Look at this, number five. Does not dishonor other people. God doesn't dishonor you. God is not there to sh po sh point that finger at you and say, man, you messed it up again? One of my favorite stories of Jesus is the woman who was caught in adultery. And, and I'm going to resist the urge to go down that bunny path. You, it's in a lot of my messages. You could almost do a roulette and pick one, and you'd find that story in there because I love it that much. He doesn't dishonor people. He doesn't look out for his own interests. He's looking out for others. Look at this. He does not become easily angered. But God, I've messed up so many times. 
Eh, are you about to throw a lightning bolt at me? No. How about this one? Does not keep track of wrongs. What are you saying, Pastor Kevin? I'm saying that when you accept Christ and you accept the payment that he made for your sins, they're gone. He's not keeping track of those wrongs. In fact, it's not just all the ones you've done up to now. It's all the ones you will even do in your entire life. He's forgiven all of those, and he's not keeping track of those things. Now, we saw last week in a sowing of seeds, and you can keep sowing some bad seeds and some bad harvests are going to come. But God isn't keeping track of your wrongs. In fact, the scripture says that he puts them into the sea, and it's as far as the east is from the west. And as far as you keep going east, you're never going to find west. You just keep going east. You can keep going around the whole earth over and over again and you can go the opposite way, and you're never going to stop going east. And that's where he throws all of our sins. Wow. Look at that verse 6. Love is not happy with evil, but is full of joy when the truth is spoken. It says that all of heaven rejoices when one person comes to Christ. Verse 7, always protects, always trusts, always hopes. And this is for somebody right here. Never gives up. God is never going to give up on you. I had someone a few years ago in a club and found out that I'm a pastor and came over and it was like trying to get close to me to ask me a question and said, are you really a pastor? I said, yes, I am, in fact. I said, I can't believe this because last night I said, God, I think I'm too far from you. I think you've given up on me, in other words. But if you haven't, send me a sign. Now, that has nothing to do with me and me being anything. This is about God never gives up. He sent a sign to this person who's calling out saying, God, if you haven't given up on me, let me know. Well, can I say right here when you see the context? He's not giving up on you. Verse 8, love never fails. God never fails. He's never going to fail you. But I prayed about this thing and it didn't happen. Yeah, that wasn't God failing you. Many times, him answering it in a different way is the ultimate protection of you. Because we want what we can see, and God sees the full picture. And again, it says one day we will see in heaven, and we'll go, oh, I get it. Because we only see one little small part, what we can see, but we don't see the entire picture. Now, Matthew 10, 8, the last part of that says, now you freely, you've received freely so give freely. So there's my challenge to you. See, 1 Corinthians 13 isn't just about this is the checklist for me to be. This is how I need to be. I need to be patient. I need to be kind. I need to be, just, I need to receive it first of all. This is who God is to me. But then what happens is when I receive it and I start trying to be like Christ, I start becoming that same attribute that he is. So where he is patient, I become patient. Where he's kind, I start to become kind. Not because I'm trying to do a checklist. Because can I tell you, checklists will never work. In fact, I often describe it as white knuckling. I'm going to do it in my own strength. I'm going to do it. And you never can for very long. But when I become like him, then who I am and what I want to do, my want to's, if you will, start to change. And then I become patient because he's patient. I become kind because he's kind. I become loving because he is love. And the rest of those things that we just looked at in great detail becomes a characterization of me. 
It says, with the measure that you meet, he will be measured back to you. The love that I give is what's going to come back to me. And again, I'll, I'll refer to last week's message. If you, if you didn't catch it, go back. You can find it on all the places where you're finding this. That we're sowing seeds that's on a collision course with our future. And that's our harvest. Matthew 7, verse 1 and 2 says, Do not judge other people, then you won't be judged. What measure you, you meet, it will be measured back to you. So if you judge other people, guess what? You're going to be judged. But in fact, it says, don't judge. In other words, it doesn't matter what someone else is doing, what it looks like is going on in their lives, don't judge them. Just love them. Verse 2, you will be judged in the same way you judge others, and you will be measured in the same way you measure others. Hey, if you're going to go out there and start putting the, 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 the measuring stick as to how godly they are up next to someone, then God's going to do that to you. Can I tell you, other people are going to do it too because that's a seed you're sowing that's going to come back in a harvest that you're also on a collision course with that you don't want to have happen. Jesus went on to say, this is how they will know that you're my disciples. But what is this? Can I suggest to you? It's really simple. This isn't the way you talk to people. This isn't the way you dress. This isn't how you have your hair that, oh, you have the same haircut Jesus has, therefore you must be like Jesus. No, the this is how you love. How close are you to God that who he is is now rubbing off on you that you're now becoming like him? Not, am I trying to check? I'm beating this up, I know. Am I checking off saying, yeah, was I patient today? Was I kind today? Did I keep track of wrongs today? No. It's about, was I like God today? And the more I pursue him, the more I become like him, then people are going to go, aha, the same way you're loving people, the same way God loves people. John 13 says this. Verse 34, a new commandment, this is Jesus speaking, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I loved you, that you also love one another. God is love. How you respond to people once you've received the love of God, and then you turn around and give it back, that's how they will know, oh, I see there's something different. Look at this, verse 35. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Not by how you do your hairstyle. Not by even the words you say. But how you love. Can I say it like this? This is how it will be evident that God's life to the full is working in you, when you love. See, you can receive Christ. You can get on the path that we talk about all the time and take the, the first step, but then you can just stand still on that path. You're on the path, but you ain't going anywhere. You see, when it becomes evident is when you begin resembling him. It's in how you respond. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't keep track of wrongs. How is you, you're able to respond when this happens to you? Maybe people will come and say, that's not normal. Yeah, that's God. They may say, how can you? And then fill in the blank. Because the natural response to this would be to X, Y, and Z. I've had many people throughout my life question, how can you endure some of the things that you've endured and you still love church and you still love God and you still love God's people. Can I tell you, it's nothing I can take credit for. It's really simply a life transformed into who he is in my life. More than allowing my natural reactions to situations. 
Let me say it like this. It's more the work that God has done in changing who I am from being what the normal reaction would be. That's our goal. This isn't me patting myself on the back. This is what we all should be attaining to. That when things happen to us that we're able to respond in such a way that it makes everybody scratch their heads and go, man, I can't believe this happened to you and you're not responding like this, but you're still reaching out in love. Can I tell you, it's so much more than the, the wristbands with the WWJD. What would Jesus do? It's so much more than that. It all has to do with sonship. It has to be with, I have this relationship with God that no matter what happens to me, I have this relationship with him. I, I've said it many times, my pastor in Florida many years ago used to say, all the water in the ocean will not sink your ship, your boat, as long as it's outside your boat. If you let a little bit of it get inside and the whole thing can take you down. See, it's all about who am I connected with? And we'll be talking more about this in the future, about being in a sonship relationship and a daughtership relationship and being a son of the Most High and a daughter of the Most High and walking into the throne room. And, and I can't wait. It's going to be a few weeks out, but I can't wait. But you see, this isn't just in my intellectual mind. It moves so far beyond that because my intellectual mind wants to respond the same way you do. Same way everybody else does. You heard me? I'm going to punch you back, Jack. That's the way it's going to happen. But you see, in 1 John, it says this. Verse 16. We all have come to know and believe that the love which God has for us, God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God. So if you're abiding in how he's loving you and you're turning to love like that, you're in this abiding, or can I say it, a relationship with God. Verse 17, by this, by this relationship, abiding with God, abiding in love, love is perfected with us. In other words, not perfect like I've arrived and no one could ever bother me. It's the completeness. Aha, I've got it. I start becoming to look like 1 Corinthians 13, love is kind, love is patient. So that we have this confidence continuing in the day of judgment because he is, so also are we in this world. I'm going to say that last part again. Because as he, Jesus, is, so also are we, underline those three words, in this world. See, this isn't about having the greatest relationship with God that one day in heaven it's just going to all be wonderful. No, it's about how we live here on earth. Verse 17, by this love is perfected in us so that we have this confidence but we are in this world. Verse 18, there is no fear in love. So if you have fear going on in your life, if fear is trying to take a hold of you, focus on love. Because right there in the scripture it says, you can go and write this one on your, on your post-it note and put it in your, in your mirror on your refrigerator and wherever you're brush, brushing your teeth. And re There's no fear in love. So if I have fear, I'm going to focus on love. The next part of that says, but perfect love casts out fear. Here's a formula. There's not many formulas in the Bible, but here's one for you. There's no fear in love. But perfect fear, perfect love, sorry, God's love casts out fear. Get in his love. Because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. Please bow your heads. Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. See, he went there before all of us. 
1 Corinthians 13 is telling us this is who God is. He first was this towards me. Therefore, I can be this. But it's based upon a relationship. But that relationship has a place where it starts. And if you've never started that relationship, today can be your day. Maybe you started that relationship and one thing to another, you stumbled and you tripped and something happened and you kind of fell off that path. Hey, it's real easy to get back on. We just saw he's patient. He never gives up. He's right there waiting for you with open arms. I invite you today to come back to him. To come back to that path and come to that journey. So whether it's coming back or if you've never been there and it's your first day to step out, I encourage you to do that and to simply pray this prayer with me. All you got to do is repeat the words after me. It's not about these words. I'm just going to help you with them. Say, God in heaven, I come to you right now just as I am. Thank you for sending Jesus to pay for my sins so I don't have to. I want to begin a new relationship with you. I invite you into my life. I ask you to reveal yourself to me and lead me in a path of following you. Today, I give you my life. And the best way I know how, I'm going to follow you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with us today, I encourage you to take the next step, and that's simply to text the word CONNECT to 469-289-1114. And again, I say it every week, but it's simply our text communication system. No one's going to spam you. No one's going to show up at your house. No one's going to bring you a loaf of bread. It's just we're going to communicate with you what your next steps could be if you'd like to take them. Let's close in prayer. Lord, this message on love is so encompassing. It's so wide-reaching. It's so overwhelming in so many ways, and yet so simple. Lord, I pray that all of us will go back and meditate on 1 Corinthians 13 and just receive all of those words of who you are to me, that you're patient with me, you're kind to me. You're not keeping track of my wrongs. You never fail me. And Lord, that we then become who you are that we start to look like you, we start to act like you, and because you loved us first, then we're able to turn around and love others. Lord, I thank you for giving us that ability. Help us all to walk in that. Father, we give you all the glory, and Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. Lord, I thank you for everyone who prayed that prayer with us for the first time or maybe another time. Lord, I speak a blessing over them. Father, I thank you for everyone that's given to belong church and sown their tithes and sown their time, sown their abilities, Lord, and reached out to other people and invited people along with us. Lord, I speak a blessing over all of those. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now watch the end for ways you can connect with us, find us on social media, and ways to give.